you remember the first picture you saw of a beach covered with garbage? How shocked you were? Adults my age remember, but my nieces and nephews don't because they were born into a world filled with garbage. They didn't cause it. It's normal for them. And adults who say, I'm so glad that the next generation is fixing the problems that we created is abdicating their responsibility. But everyone says, but I'm just one person. What difference can I make? I saw the video with the turtle with a straw in his nose. Have you ever actually tried avoiding straws? I did. I was out with friends. The waiter brought out glasses with straws in them. I said, do you mind taking them back? I'm trying to avoid them. He said, he just have to throw them away. We might as well just use them. I didn't change anything. What more proof did I need that what I did didn't matter? Global problems need global solutions. Only governments and corporations can act on the scale that we need. This stupid straw business is just distracting us from problems that we really need to solve. Really, we need things like fusion. Or so I thought anyway. One day I looked at my garbage and thought, maybe I can't fix all the world's problems, but I can take responsibility for my garbage. So I challenged myself to go for a week without buying any packaged food. I knew how to cook, but not from scratch. So I expected it to cost more and taste worse. Frankly, I expected to fail. After a few days, I finished everything in my cupboards. I went to the store, to the shelves where I normally start. For the first time, instead of seeing the food, I saw the packaging around it. The bottles, the jars, cans, boxes, bags, stickers. I have an Ivy League PhD and MBA. I helped launch a satellite and several companies. I believe that I can say that I reached the pinnacle of our culture. And I couldn't eat. I couldn't live without polluting and hurting others. With no alternative, I bought only fresh fruits and vegetables and dried beans from the bulk section. I'm not proud of this, but for the first time, I boiled beans on the stove. I made it two and a half weeks and decided to keep going, not at zero, but at minimal packaging. After a few months, my cooking became delicious. People hire me to host dinners. I lead workshops in food deserts to fill them in. I can easily describe the material results of this experiment. I saved time and money, got coastal of family and nature. I learned how to shop at farmer's markets. I met the farmers on their farms who grow most of my food. I started a windowsill garden. I went from emptying my garbage from weekly to monthly to annually. I last emptied my garbage in 2019. Next month will be two years on one single load. The mental changes were bigger. Why did I expect deprivation and higher costs? I thought cooking from scratch would be boring compared to eating out, but that was my inexperience. I found it's easier, cheaper, more convenient, less noisy. Waiters aren't rushing us. I also associated packaged food with variety and convenience, but nothing compares with fresh. More flavor, nuance, complexity, variety. All packaged food does is numb our senses and fill our oceans with garbage. The results surprised me so much that I looked in other parts of my life for things like packaged food. I challenged myself to avoid flying for a year. No one believes me when I say how hard it was or how much it improved my life. So I won't try, but it's one of the best things I've done. Now I haven't flown since 2016, happily, and I probably never will again. When I learned that most other cultures don't refrigerate like we do, I just walked out of my fridge, unplugged it, and forced myself to learn to ferment in the time that it took the stuff to melt. I made it three months my first try, six and a half months my second try. Now a typical electric bill is $2. My record is $1.40. I started picking up litter daily, surprisingly rewarding, and now I haven't missed a day since 2017. Overall, I've dropped my footprint over 90%. I'm not talking about individual action adding up, though it may. I'm talking about what I found in sustainability. Joy, fun, freedom, community, connection, meaning, purpose. But even environmentalists, actually, especially environmentalists, present sustainability like it's a deprivation, sacrifice, like it's a burden, like it's a chore. We have nearly no role models trying to live sustainably. They haven't found that joy, so they can't share it. So I started a podcast, This Sustainable Life, to create those role models. My guests include leaders from business, politics, sports, culture, and other areas. I lead them through what's now called the Spodek Method to share and act on their environmental values, many practicing stewardship for the first time. They love the experience and recommend me to their peers. Guests also include hardcore Trump supporters, evangelicals, staunch Republicans, military, and many that many environmentalists consider adversaries. Why? Want change? Want votes? 
engage with people who disagree with you. I learn from them. We become friends. The podcast has become a growing family with other hosts reaching other audiences. Beyond the podcast, I help these leaders work to change their organizations. They've heard their peers called greenwashing or hypocritical. They think they have to be perfect. They don't. They only have to show that they're doing their best, a much lower bar, but they have to show that they're doing it genuinely and authentically, which my individual action allows me to lead them to do. Then people support them for their flaws. My individual action enables me to lead them. Systemic change begins with personal change. If we value growth and extraction, we'll innovate technologies that may lower pollution locally, but if we make a polluting system more efficient, we pollute more efficiently. We have been chasing efficiency since before the Industrial Revolution. What matters is total pollution, and we are polluting more, more effectively than ever. The difference between the verdant, fertile world of our ancestors and our polluted one today is the physical manifestation of our values and culture, implemented by our behavior, augmented by our technologies. If we magically transformed our pollution levels to pre-industrial, but didn't change our values, we'd be right back here again. Norman Borlaug, father of the Green Revolution, saw this happen as, in his words, the population monster grew to recreate the hunger that he thought that he solved. He warned that technology alone would only grow our problems. We are living his predictions. Even fusion will only repeat the pattern unless we change our values. How do we? By acting. To clarify, we're not changing them. We're uncovering values suppressed so long most of us have forgotten about them. Everybody values clean air, water, and land. You may be wondering how to start without wasting your time like I did with the straws. I found the biggest bang for your buck. I'm not saying it alone will change everything, but you can start right away and you don't have to wait for governments and corporations to start. You'll see how to reduce 90%. I think you'll also find it fun. For many people, what to eat is a horror show. It was for me because I always had ice cream and pretzels at home. Thinking about them made me feel shame, which made me think about them, which made me eat them, which made me feel more shame, and the cycle continued for decades. Fast food, junk food, ultra-processed food, convenience food. Maybe you've heard Michael Pollan's term, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. The term food in these phrases confuses people. Consider two cases. First, parents in a food desert. People say that with a dollar, they can fill their kids' bellies with more from McDonald's than from a farmer's market. Second, people addicted to salt, sugar, fat, and convenience. They point out an alcoholic can just not go to a bar, but unlike any other addiction, they have to face theirs every meal. These views assume broccoli and Doritos are the same, and they're not. We give kids Taco Bell, saying fast food may not be the best food, but it's still food. It's not. They could assuage their kids' hunger with heroin too or cocaine, and if we called it poppy extract or coca leaf extract, they might. Our language distinguishes them from the plants we refine them from, but not sugar from sugarcane or corn syrup from corn, and so we accept them. To end that confusion, I offer a new word, doof, which is food backward, and I cannot overstate how much it clarifies and simplifies. Where you used to say fast food, junk food, and things like that, say doof. Guests from the podcast already use the term, including Dr. Joel Furman, who wrote Eat to Live, New York City's mayor, Eric Adams, Dr. Michael Turner, and more. They find it fun. I'm not there in person, but let's try it. Imagine someone offered you a frappuccino or bottled water. You'd say, no thanks, I avoid doof, so let's try it. Would you like a frappuccino or bottled water? That's right, I hope you enjoyed it. I'm not saying never eat doof, actually, Eat is for food, doof you consume, and they want you to consume as much as possible. Just, if you consume doof, don't consider it food, it's not eating, it's more like a weird, unhealthy entertainment for your mouth. Eat all the food you want. Try eating too much kale or blueberries. You can't. Just, if you give a kid doof, you still need to give them food for nutrition that doof lacks. Doof impoverishes communities like a payday loan store. My charge to you, Never call doof food, but eat all the food that you want. Common clues that something is doof. It's advertised, it's packaged, fiber has been refined out. You have to draw your line for yourself for gray zone things like meat, alcohol, refined oils. But the big one is manufacturer's intent. If they engineered it to create craving, 
That's doof. I remember an ad campaign that said, bet you can't eat just one. They know exactly what they're doing. Seeing the industry choose profit over my health and the world's made doof disgusting and made reducing 90% and all those other changes effortless. They took years, but I had to overcome decades of, frankly, addiction to Cherry Garcia. Maybe you can do changes on my scale, maybe not, but you can choose to use this one word and start your journey. It gets easier with every step. Decrease your salt and sugar and your food will taste bland, but after a month, your old amounts will become unbearable. Apples to me today taste sweeter than Snickers ever did. More sweetness, less sugar, may sound too good to be true, but once you've lived it, it's obvious. The doof concept revealed to me a spectrum. At one end is wholesome, enduring reward, family, community, personal growth, stewardship. At the other end is craving, always more, never satisfied. We tend to think of heroin and crack as the extreme, but confusing food with doof, we don't know to protect ourselves against it. Orders of magnitude more people die and suffer from heart disease, diabetes, pollution, and other doof consequences than from drugs. So doof is farther out on the spectrum. What else lies at this end? Facebook, social media, binge TV, fast fashion, bucket lists. I believe in time, you will find them all doof. Note their manufacturer's intent and values. Remember I said our stewardship values were suppressed? These doof values suppress them. Yes, they bring pleasure. They also lower health, longevity, freedom, and Earth's ability to sustain life. Risking population collapse, billions may suffer and die. You've read the headlines. Do we just accept what doof values cause, or do we choose our values deliberately? As long as we confuse doof with food in life, not just diet, we'll keep sleepwalking into catastrophe. The concept of doof lays bare a lie at the heart of our culture that more improves quality of life, but more doof lowers it, whether Nestle, Instagram, Amazon Prime, or just plain methamphetamines. Almost no one suggests less as a solution because they fear it as a horror show, which doof industries love, but less doof means more sweetness less sugar. Maybe you're thinking, but if we don't grow the economy, we'll lose our tax base. Infrastructure will crumble. Hospitals will close. Mothers will die in childbirth. And 30 will become old age again. Is that what you want, Josh, to return to the Stone Age? But that's the addiction speaking. Countless human societies have thrived without growing and extracting. Meanwhile, countless others have grown too much and collapsed. How much less can we consume? This graph of my current footprint after removing doof from my life, compared to the average Americans, says we can drop 75 to 90%, improving our lives. At these numbers, we don't need fusion, and America would gain the credibility to lead others. Right now, we're leading them in the opposite direction. Imagine more health, happiness, and freedom, reducing billions suffering. What about people without resources? It's easy to think that low-cost stuff helps them, and in individual cases, it can. But systemically, doof extracts value. It causes and exacerbates poverty. Reducing it helps the most needy, but they pollute the least anyway. The people with the most resources pollute the most. They also fear giving up their stuff the most. That makes sense. The heaviest users tend to be the most addicted and make the most excuses. So if you feel that you can't give up flying or whatever else, consider that you may be among the most addicted and benefit the most from enduring withdrawal. I'm not promising world peace, just a new direction you can take that will lead you to more sweetness, less sugar. As more people join us, instead of what I do doesn't matter, you will see that the fastest, most effective way to change governments and corporations is to start with yourself now. I didn't say do one thing and then stop. When you get the doof concept, you'll find yourself doing more and wanting to do more and more and more. People will follow you out of joy. Systemic change begins with personal change. Doof values make us entitled, lacking gratitude and appreciation, twisting us up inside, knowing that we're hurting people for our indulgence. When we steward, nature responds not with ocean dead zones and a pandemic that goes global in weeks because we fly so much, but with beauty and abundance. Peaches, blueberries, vibrant blue skies, 
deep blue oceans. I work with executives and politicians. They want to change. They're scared. They probably should change on their own, but our avoiding doof will help them stop producing it so that they can close the factories and plug the oil wells supplying them. My charge again, never call doof food. Avoid doof in life. As your joy increases and your pollution decreases, friends, family, community, and whole industries will follow. Now let's practice saying, no thanks, I avoid doof. You're gonna say it now. Would you like a Coke or a Pepsi? No, no thanks, I avoid doof. Great. There's a sale at Zara. Wanna go? No thanks, I avoid doof. You got it. Thank you. And never call doof food. So you can enjoy food in all of life.